have a change in the song that the Sanctuary Choir will be sharing uh, this morning. Uh, sometimes we have to work with uh, the people we have, and so that is the case today. And the song that they'll be singing, uh, which by the way, you were present last Sunday night, what a blessing that was uh, from start to finish all the way through. And any song that they would choose out of that miracle, and it was a miracle, it was a musical miracle, <laughs> and it was just a blessing. And so any song they sang uh, could never go wrong. And so this song, he knows my name. He knows everything about me. And as opposed to me trying to tell you what's in the song, I'll just let you listen to the Sanctuary Choir sing and be blessed by that. He knows my name. And the children and the youth will be joining us. And if you know it, you are more than welcome to sing along. You may be seated. Thank you, children and youth, by the way, Ms. Lynn, Ms. Alice, for uh, joining us for our worship time this morning and for being a part of our uh, presentation on the past Sunday evening. What a blessing, and we realized that for a lot of reasons, the weather being one of them, uh, there were some who were not going to be present today, and we understand that. But thank you, young people. And with that, we'll dismiss uh, you for your children and youth worship time. So if you'll be dismissed with Ms. Lynn, Ms. Alice, and those who are going to be assisting them, if you would. Uh, somewhere this week, I heard that 65 years ago, Brenda Lee wrote a song, Rocking Around the Christmas Tree. We're not going to sing that this morning, but we are going to sing one that has been around much longer than 1965. The songs that we're singing have been with us for as long as I can remember, 
And that's a, that's a pretty good while. And so when we sing these songs, it's, mess, it's a message that you never get tired of hearing, you never get tired of singing. And so this song, there's a song in the air. Join us as we stand, as we sing. Remain standing with your Bibles open to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. We'll read the first seven verses, and uh, we'll be making reference to other parts of this same chapter, indeed, uh, other books in the Bible. But this is God's Word for us today. It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one unto his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary his espoused wife, being great with child, and so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Our Father, we just thank you that we have a written record of the events of one of the greatest moments that has ever taken place in this world. And certainly for each person who stands in need, and we all do, of salvation, forgiveness of sin, the hope of eternal life, there is that promise that became flesh. There is the word that became flesh. There is that hope that we saw, not in a doctrine, but in a person. Thank you, Father, today that we can come together and worship together thousands of years after the birth of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, we can know today that God is on his throne, that our blessed Lord is seated at the right hand of the Father, and through the person and power and presence of the Holy Spirit, you come to live in our hearts, and for that we thank you. And so we have the greatest gift that anyone could ever have, the precious gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. We realize this morning 
even as we say that, even as we worship together, there are thousands who do not know Christ as their Savior. They've never accepted him. And our prayer today is they might come to that moment when they will open their heart, invite Jesus Christ in, and know the blessing of a Savior who forgives and gives us a hope of eternity with our Lord. In whose name we pray, amen. May be seated if you would. It is a joy to greet you here. And oftentimes you will hear me make reference to what I call the Sunday after. Uh, sometimes it can be the Sunday after homecoming. It can be the Sunday after Easter. But in this case, it is the Sunday after the presentation of the Christmas musical. And by the definition, we just praise the Lord for what he did uh, through the people who were willing to be a part of that ministry last Sunday, whether it was through the sanctuary choir or those who uh, were servant and uh, guidance capacity, or those who came and just joined in worship, which by the way, perhaps know that before the hour of the presentation last week, there was a real apprehension about whether anybody would get here because of the fog that settled in. We're thankful for those that did, and we're thankful that everyone arrived home safely. And so we want you to know that every Sunday is a new Sunday. Every day is a new day. Every sermon is a new sermon, I can assure you that. We may sing the same song, and I may make reference to the same scripture, but I can tell you today that for me, I want God's word to be fresh. I want it to be something that you may have heard before, but you hear it in a different way. And what I really want is for the Spirit of God to use what I say, or better yet, what he says through me, to comfort, to encourage, or to convict, whatever the case may be. I want the Lord to do his work, even as I participate in that, and you are on the receiving end. And that means you're going to get a blessing. Speaking of a blessing, we're going to get one now. We have watched Lauren James grow up in this church, physically and spiritually. We've watched as the Lord has led her uh, to her college time. And uh, now she's getting ready to make another move to Mary Washington. And so we thank the Lord for her gift. It's been a while, Lawrence, since uh, you've been here. And that's on us. We'll, take, we'll make sure we, we don't let that go as long next time. But this morning, Lauren comes to share with us instrumental. And this is the gift that God has given her. And the title of this is, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Lauren, would you come? share with us in this ministry.
you, Lord, for your ministry to us. God bless you and as you move ahead in whatever the Lord may have for you. If you've been around any length of time, you know that I'm not a big fan. In fact, I'm not a fan at all of circumstances. I'm a big fan of divine providence. I believe if and when you trust the Lord as your personal Savior, you put yourself under the umbrella of God's divine provision, God's divine providence. And I just think that covers provisions and protection, among other things. But, and I do believe that when we look at the events of the world, current events no less, we have to wonder, where is God? Why does he allow certain things to happen? The fact of the matter is, you could have said that at any point from the beginning of creation till now. You could have said that any time throughout the Old Testament. And the word providence just simply comes from the fact, the phrase that means to see before. And I can tell you that God didn't sit down one day with a legal pad and scratch out notes and said, I think I will try this. And then after second thought, scratched that out and said, no, I think I will try this. I can tell you God has no plan B. From the foundation of the world, God knew exactly what was going to happen, when it was going to happen, and how it was going to happen. I can tell you concerning the birth of Jesus Christ that it was in the providence of God that everything happened as it did, when it did, and where it did. It was in the providence of God that Mary and Joseph came together as husband and wife, considering the fact that they had little or no choice or say in the situation, that there were others, given the policy of that time, who put them together. But beyond that, and you're going to catch me this morning saying something like, this happened or that happened, but I want you to know that over that, whatever else, it was in the providence of God that Mary and Joseph would come together, that she would be the mother of Jesus Christ. You've heard me say that it has been stated recently that God searched over heaven looking for somebody that would qualify to be the mother of baby Jesus. That's not a word of truth in that. From the foundation of the world, Jesus, God knew that Mary was going to be the mother of Jesus. And from the foundation of the world, he knew how she was going to be conceived, and that was by the Holy Spirit. And so I want to point out to you today about the birth of Christ that everything was according to God's divine providence. First of all, I want you to know that the time of Jesus Christ was birth was according to to divine providence. It was in God's plan. From the foundation of the world, he knew when it was going to happen. And obviously, there was a 400-year period between the close of the Old Testament and the birth of Jesus Christ. 400 years, not a word, nothing from the Lord. But the scripture says in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, to be born of a woman. And so when was Jesus Christ born? Exactly when God planned it to be. And among all the th other things that happened, Luke gives us an account, which by the way, he also gives us the genealogy uh, of that time, but Luke goes back to Adam, whereas Matthew goes back to David. Because Matthew wanted to prove the royal lineage of Jesus Christ, that he was entitled to sit upon the throne of David, whereas Luke wants to prove 
that Jesus Christ was a man. He was a human. He was a human being. And he wants us to know that Jesus Christ was flesh and bone and flesh and blood just like we are. He walked among us. He was one of us. And so the scripture says, as a matter of fact, he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That was the one difference. And so when you go back to the genealogy as recorded by Luke, you might find some names there, which by the way, it's often been said that one man asked somebody, paid somebody $500 to trace his family tree, and then he paid them another $500 to keep quiet about it. And so I just want you to know today, you might want to be careful about shaking your family tree. You might not know what's going to fall out of it. I'd be careful about shaking my family tree because I do know what's going to fall out of it. And so I'm going to be careful about that. But I want to tell you, Luke takes us all the way back to Adam. He wants to prove Jesus Christ was a human being. He came to live among us. He felt the things that we felt. But something had to happen in order for the events to unfold for the fullness of time. And it would be that Caesar Augustus issued a decree that all the world should be taxed. It's interesting because in the scheme of God, in the plan of God, he is not opposed to using ungodly people to fulfill his plan. He knows that, and he, you think there's no way he would do that. Yes, he did. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 15, the scripture says that the people were told that you don't even realize that you crucified the Prince of Glory. You don't even realize what you did. What he really said was, you don't realize that while you thought you were getting rid of your greatest enemy, you were simply fulfilling the plan of God. When you put Jesus Christ on that cross, you were just an instrument in his hand to be sure God could have called 10,000 angels and destroyed the world and put it into all of that. But he allowed it to go forth because that was his plan. And so Caesar Augustus was one of those people. Caesar Augustus had the good fortune or divine providence. He was the favorite grand nephew of Julius Caesar. And when Julius Caesar was murdered and Mark Anthony committed suicide, that opened the way for Claudius Octavius, Caius Octavius. That was Caesar Augustus' given name, Caius Octavius. But when Julius Caesar was murdered and Mark Anthony committed suicide, that opened the way. And so Caius Octavius took the name Caesar Augustus. Caesar kind of as an adopted name and Augustus for who knows why. And, but make no mistake about it, any word from a pagan emperor of that time and everybody stood up and took notice. Everybody did what they were told to do. And Caesar Augustus issued a decree that all the world should be taxed, just what they needed, another tax, divine providence. Little did he realize he was simply a player in God's plan. He issued a decree that all the world should be taxed. That meant that David and Mary, Joseph and Mary, had to go to Bethlehem, the city of David. They had to go because they were of the house and the lineage of David. And so it's a three days journey, as we mentioned last week, it is no possibility that Mary is not going to go. She is going to go. And the timing of it put them in Jerusalem, and they've got another five miles to Bethlehem. It is in the providence of God that when they got there, they went to the inn looking for a room and could not find one. Make no mistake about it. If God had so ordained, 
there would have been a room in that inn. He would have made sure, maybe he would have killed the innkeeper. I don't know what he would have done. But he would have made provision for the Christ child to be born in an inn and not in a cattle stall and not in a, in a stable. But he did. The scripture is very, it's very interesting. And I have to wonder, when Mary and Joseph, who, by the way, came from Nazareth, you recall when we talk about Peter, when uh, he was accused, rightly so, of being one of Jesus' disciples, on one of the three occasions when he denied Christ, they told him, your accent gives you away. That Nazareth accent gives you away. I have to wonder, when Joseph and Mary went into that room, uh, into that inn and asked for a room, is it possible that his Nazareth accent immediately just set that innkeeper off and thought, let these people from Nazareth, let these people with that weird accent stay in a cattle stall. No, we don't have any room here. I'm just throwing that out. I don't know, but I'm telling you, it is a strong possibility. And so, off they go to the inn, and Joseph pieces together a manger. And while they really have no provisions for personal hygiene, they've got to do what they've got to do with what they have to do, with which to do. So meanwhile, out on the hill, there are shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night. And who would be the first people to whom the angels would come to announce the birth of Jesus Christ? Once again, one of, if not the most despised people on earth. I would be willing to say that next to the Samaritans, the shepherds were despised about as much as anybody. And so, out on the hill, while they were no doubt singing or humming or doing what they do to keep their flocks calm by night, the angel appears to them. And what they really see, I guarantee, would scare any of us out of our wits if we were on a hillside in the middle of the night. They saw the glory of God. They saw the Shekinah glory. I'm telling you, you've never seen anything that bright. No wonder the angel would first say to them, which, by the way, we aren't told if that was Gabriel or not, but I do know that the first words to the shepherds were the first words that Gabriel said to Mary, Fear not, fear not. And so he says to the shepherds, Fear not, because I want you to know that unto you is born this night in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Isn't it interesting? The angel would kind of be saying, listen, we've got enough sovereigns. We have enough of those. We've got enough soldiers. We don't need any more soldiers. What we need, what this world needs, is a Savior. And I just want to echo that statement this morning to tell you what this world needs is a Savior. We need Jesus. And the only one who can fix what's wrong with this world is Jesus Christ. Make no mistake about it. And it may very well be that we're out of here before anything gets fixed. Make no mistake about it. So this, you need to understand the Savior is born in Bethlehem. For unto you is born this night in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the baby Jesus wrapped in swaddly clothes, lying in a manger. Of all this thing, oh, you got to be kidding. This shall be a sign unto you. That's the sign? We're going to find the baby Jesus wrapped in swaddly clothes, lying in a manger? Of all the signs that God ever did, of all the miracles that he ever did, he caused the sun to stand still one day? He turned the sea into blood one day. He turned the sundial back one day. And that's all that's best you can do for a sign is baby Jesus, the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. That's all you need. 
That's all you need. And if you know that, and the scripture says that, suddenly the heavens were open, and Mount Carmel Choir was singing right there with the birth of Jesus Christ. The angel, the angelic chorus, listen, I can tell you, everybody else in Jerusalem, everybody else in Bethlehem had no time and what those people missed that day, what those people missed that night, let them party, let them sleep, but the angels in heaven are not going to allow the birth of Jesus Christ to go by unannounced and unnoticed. All of the angels of heaven joined together in a hallelujah chorus, and the angels of Scripture is very clear that the angel of the Lord come upon them, the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and suddenly there was with the multitude the angel, a, a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. You read that verse, and you say, Pastor, it doesn't really look like there's any peace on earth right now. Yes, it is too. And I can tell you where you'll find it, in the heart of every believer. In the midst of this chaos, in the midst of this crazy world, in the midst of this turmoil, in the midst of a world where human beings are acting like they're not even human beings, when we don't even see human decency, when we don't even see common courtesy, when we don't even see the things that should be very natural for us, when we don't see that, I can tell you there is peace on earth. And what that verse really means is God has declared amnesty. And anyone who wants to put their faith in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that baby Jesus, can have peace with God. Therefore, being justified by faith, the apostle said, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You want peace today? The only place you'll find it is through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so it's interesting because the angels in heaven closed up the choir. The angels in heaven returned to their, their, their location. And so the shepherds are left with what to do, what to do, what to do. And they said, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is comes to pass. Which, by the way, the other part of that sign, you'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. Even in the birth of Jesus Christ, there was a hint of the death that he would die. And there's going to be another one I'll tell you about in a minute. There's, going, there's a hint of the death that he would die because swaddling means bandages. The baby Jesus was basically wrapped in bandages. And even in the birth of Jesus Christ, in the divine providence of God, the baby Jesus was wrapped in bandages as to foretell the death that he would die for our sin. And so the, the shepherd said, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass. And the scripture says, and I love this, in verse 16, and they came with haste. They did not say, let's wait until morning. They said, let's get after it. They were like the two on the road to Emmaus who from the moment they realized Jesus Christ was in their presence, right at that time, they took flight right back to Jerusalem to tell the people, to tell the people that Jesus Christ was alive. He spent time with us. The shepherds are going to make sure they do not miss this opportunity. And so the scripture said they came with haste and they found Mary and Joseph in verse 16. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which were told them concerning this child. Isn't it interesting? The first evangelists for Jesus Christ were shepherds. They came with haste. They came, they saw, and they said. They told what they had said. And this is also true. And all they that heard it 
wondered at those things which were told them by the disciples. Oh, great day. Is that the best they can do? Apparently so. They weren't there for the birth of Christ. And now that the shepherds have told them what they saw, they still apparently don't feel too enthused about that. And so I can tell you, those lowly shepherds went back to their sheep with a song in their heart. And I can tell you, their feet were barely touching the ground as they walked or as they ran, whatever they did. There's one other thing I've got to tell you about the providence of God. It was the providence of God that Jesus Christ be born in Bethlehem. It was the providence of God that the shepherds would be the first one to receive the news of his birth and the first one to go to that manger and see for themselves. But there came a time, the scripture says, and it's recorded in the same chapter, Mary and Joseph took the baby Jesus to the temple for the ritual that they were responsible for fulfilling. When they got there, they met a man by the name of Simeon. Simeon is an old man now. He's been around a while, but it's interesting because something happened, and this is what it said. There was a man in Jerusalem in verse 25 whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. It's interesting three times in that scripture, it says the Spirit of God was involved in it. I want you to know Simeon did not have a hallucination. I want you to know this was not a mirage. I want you to know that he was there in the providence of God. And in the providence of God, he was told he would not die until he had seen the consolation of Israel, which was exactly what Jesus Christ was going to bring. And there he was, an old man, to hold the baby Jesus in his arms by divine providence. And I want you to know, he said, Lord, it's okay. I'm ready to go. I have seen the salvation of Israel. I want to tell you, Simeon held the baby Jesus in his arms, and he said, I'm ready to go. When you hold him in your heart, you too can say, I'm ready to go. Unless and until you do that, you're not ready. You're not ready to go. You had best pray that you get that opportunity. Best yet, you better pray that you take that opportunity before the Lord calls you home because Simeon had that opportunity. And what a blessing, what a moment that must have been. And by the way, what he received that day was dependent on Mary and Joseph doing what they should do in order that they would be there where Simeon was present. As our worship leaders come, prepare for our invitation. I want to understand, want you to understand today, in your life in particular, and this world in general, there are things that are happening that we don't understand why God is allowing us. We, I believe it was Dr. Charles Stanley who said, we don't understand why why God is indifferent. We don't understand. It's like he doesn't care. It's like he doesn't know. And if he's not in, indifferent, then he certainly is inactive. But I can tell you, he also said that God may not 
be speaking, but he's never still. God's always moving, whether you see it or not, whether you know it or not. In the divine providence of God, he leads people to be in a certain place at a certain time. He allows things to happen in our life that given our choice, we would just as soon avoid. But God is clearly leading the orchestra. God is clearly orchestrating things in the world today. And you can talk about circumstances all you want, but I'm telling you, we must and we better wake up to the matter of divine providence. You say, well, if God could stop this, why doesn't he? He doesn't have to answer that, and he's not going to. You need to know that everything that God does is for our growth and his glory. And that's it. And if you're not a believer today, there are things that are happening in your life. And they may not be very pleasant, but God's getting your attention. And you need to get his. You need to tell him, Lord, I'm not fighting you anymore. I'm not fighting you. I want to be a member of your family. I said this before, and I say it again as we sing this song. If Jesus Christ, hear this, if Jesus Christ were born in Bethlehem 1,000 times and not once in your heart, you'll be eternally lost. It's not about Jesus being in Bethlehem, being born in Bethlehem. Obviously, that's a part of it. But unless and until you have that new birth in your heart, you're not going to be a part of what God has for you. God bless those shepherds for running, making haste, seeing baby Jesus and telling everybody about it. And I wonder, did anybody really believe? Did anybody in that town go to the manger to see for themselves? It doesn't say that. We don't know. But we do know this. They heard. And I can tell you, news like that is going to get around town. Is it not? And so if you want to start a celebration in heaven today, you want, you want the, the angels of heaven to touch off a celebration right in the presence of the Lord. Give your heart to Jesus Christ. Give your heart to the Lord as we stand and as we sing. This is your song. This is your moment. What a song. Jesus is Lord of all. Say that and mean it.
couple months ago, we had a soup and sandwich lunch after worship as a part of one of our mission programs. And today we are doing likewise. Uh, this is the season for the Body Moon Christmas offering and provisions have been made for soup and sandwich lunch and then Jennifer will introduce you to the missions uh, program that we have and I really call it a ministry because it really is. This is a time when we focus on missionaries who are serving in foreign countries and you will be amazed to learn how many there are in how many countries. And so we want you to join us uh, and just enjoy the fellowship time. And I don't know what provisions have been made today. I do know that last time there was something like 15 crock pots of soup. So I don't know that that many today, but whatever it is, it will be sufficient and it will be good. And uh, with that, we will include the blessing for the food as we are dismissed. Father, today we can look at our lives and see how the Lord has worked in marvelous ways. The scripture is, is very clear that God is always aware of what is happening in our life. We know that God does move in mysterious ways. And sometimes he plants his footsteps on the sea and rides upon the storm, there's no doubt about that. But God moves, and many times we fail to see that in the moment. But down the road we look back, and we see how God used that. So we never question what the Lord is doing. Whatever that may be, we trust him, because he doesn't have a plan B. He has seen the end from the beginning, and only he has done that, and he planned accordingly. And so we thank you, Father, today for the privilege of knowing him, and knowing that we have put our lives under that divine providence umbrella. Thank you, Lord, for the provisions that have been made today, for the food that has been prepared, the loving hands that have prepared it, and for the time to just learn something more about what Jesus Christ is doing to get the gospel throughout the world. In his precious and loving and saving name we pray. Amen. all of God's people say, I am under the divine umbrella. I Amen. Am under the divine umbrella. Amen. <laughs> 